Okay, uh, it is uh, September uh, 25th, 2018. We are in the Computer History Museum. We have the pleasure of recording the history of uh, Charlie Trimble. Now, the name Trimble and GPS uh, are so intimately connected that they're almost synonymous. But I think a number of people might be surprised if they, uh, for example, wanted to buy a GPS for their automobile. Uh, they might not find one that they could uh, really be happy with in the Trimble uh, Library of High-End GPS Equipment. They also might be surprised to think about how the uh, GPS got into uh, their cell phones and small like that. Again, those are something that, uh, that Trimble had a lot to do with, but it isn't in their product line right now. So with that, uh, Charlie, tell us uh, the story of how you come from an avocado orchard to founding silicon, uh, not silicon, but founding uh, Trimble Navigation. Wow. All right. The, uh, uh, I grew up on an avocado ranch uh, in Fallbrook that's uh, uh, about oh, 70 miles south of Los Angeles. Um, and I, it actually was Sputnik, I think, that, um, uh, that affected me the way it affected uh, many people in my generation. Um, and, uh, and, and focus my attention on, uh, uh, on math and science and, and space. And uh, uh, a couple years later, um, I ended up uh, um, going to Caltech, and uh, I thought I uh, wanted to be a mathematician, but uh, uh, soon learned that, uh, at least at Caltech, um, you had to, uh, to be absolutely brilliant uh, and probably lazy uh, to uh, be able to make it as a math major. I, uh, I um, followed the, uh, the normal course of things there and um, uh, was interested in physics, but um, uh, actually for the sake of summer jobs, uh, I, uh, I switched my uh, option to engineering because I could take the same physics courses in engineering and uh, it was an awful lot easier to get summer jobs as an engineer than it was as a physics major. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think it was my senior year, I came to the conclusion that uh, it was going to take me five years to get a PhD. Um, I, my time schedule had, had been three. I, I did have friends that did make it in three, but, uh, but I wasn't going to be able to do it. Um, and besides that, uh, what I learned at Caltech was uh, uh, there was no way that I could be at the, uh, the top level of academia. Um, but if I uh, pursued the, uh, the realm between technology and business, most of those people that could be at the top uh, rung in academia couldn't survive. So. Uh, I uh, made up my mind to come back to uh, Caltech and uh, get an easy master's degree and then go to Harvard and get an MBA. So this was a tactical decision at the time? It was a tactical decision. Um, and uh, uh, actually, uh, I got only one offer, actually, for a summer job after uh, getting my master's degree uh, from Caltech. Uh, Al Bagley, who was uh, uh, then a division manager at Hewlett Packard and had actually uh, pulled Hewlett Packard into the digital era, uh, hired me for the summer. And um, unbeknownst to me, he had set himself the goal of keeping bright young engineers from going to either Harvard or Stanford Business School. And so by the end of the summer, uh, he bribed me into staying at HP um, by offering me my own project. Um, this, this project uh, led to what was then known as a computer of average transience, um, basically pulling uh, repetitive evoked responses out of the noise. Um, and uh, 
these were the days before microprocessors and um, uh, uh, the uh, most complex uh, form, integrated forms were things like four-bit full ladders. Um, so uh, state machine, um, but being at this point in time, 1964, uh, Hewlett Packard had, uh, had an in with Stanford and uh, um, Hewlett Packard employees were, learn were allowed to learn how to program and, um, and actually submit programs to the B5500 over at Stanford. And I ended up uh, um, using the, uh, uh, the B5500 to simulate my state machine to be sure that uh, signal averaging worked. Along the way, I, I came to realize that, um, that uh, the uh, Shannon could be turned around and um, if you're dealing with signals that have signal to noise ratios that are less than unity, there is only one, there's less than one bit of information um, available per sample. And um, this turned out to be awfully important later with GPS. So I was at HP for 14 years. Um, last job there, I um, was R&D manager for a um, integrated circuit facility. Um, actually, it's a bipolar integrated circuit facility. We had the capability of putting down 500 matched uh, 5 gigahertz FT transistors on a chip. So you could do things like uh, make um, um, very fast 4-bit quantizers or, or make flip-flops that actually would toggle at 2 gigahertz. Uh, the, uh, and along the way, um, um, computers started coming into HP. Um, I actually, uh, I built my first computer by uh, 2116 by part. Um, it was late enough in the year and I needed it for an IC tester project. Uh, it was late enough in the year that um, the, uh, they had frozen capital equipment budgets but if you bought things by the part, uh, you could uh, assemble things and, uh, and get around the system. And so that's how my first uh, 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 16K, uh, 2116, uh, came into being. Now, did Hewlett Packard at that time even have a commercial computer? Or yes, was it? it was the 2116. The it, 2116, yeah. They, uh, they competed with DEC for the mini computer market. And uh, uh, later, they, um, they got into the computing calculator uh, market, and later still, um, the, uh, the handheld um, Model 35. But uh, uh, by 78, Hewlett Packard had transitioned from being, in, um, being a technology-driven company to a marketing-driven uh, company to a resource allocation-driven company. And uh, to work on things that were entrepreneurial, you had to be working on things that were 10 years out. Five years was fine for me, 10 years um, uh, a little too long. Um, and uh, there was a reorganization that took place at that point in time. Um, Al Bagley was kicked upstairs and a fellow by the name of John Blocker came in to take over the um, Frequency and Time Division. Uh, he had been entrepreneurial and um, uh, with, uh, with Al being kicked upstairs, Al's pet project of a Loran C navigation product uh, was canceled. And uh, so I actually had the audacity to uh, um, to offer to buy it. And they wouldn't let you do that. <laughs> well, they gave me a hard time because I was offering uh, $50,000 and they wanted $200. Uh, and uh, in retrospect, the $200 was perfectly reasonable. I mean, they, had, they were fundamentally at final prototype. They hadn't done the complete tooling. Um, 
Um, there were um, uh, final prototypes around, um, um, and I got um, uh, a couple of bays of test equipment and lots of reading material. Anyway, could, could you describe the uh, product itself? I mean, what was the, it going to look like in the market? Uh, it actually was going to be something that um, um, was about that size. Uh, it had a um, a single line display. It would read out in either latitude or longitude. Uh, you had to toggle, uh, but then you could only write one of them down at a time. Uh, and what was special about it was that uh, uh, there were um, bias corrections put in so that the time difference lines actually um, 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 would, uh, could lead to accurate um, latitude longitude positions. The, uh, the propagation velocity of radio waves um, um, uh, over land differ greatly by whether it's arid or irrigated. And um, so the Lorand C maps that um, uh, with these overprinted uh, line difference lines that the Coast Guard put out in that sort of time frame were off by 1.3 miles in Los Angeles and, uh, and two miles in San Diego. Mm -hmm. and, and these uh, are very low frequency systems. Uh, 100 kilohertz. Yeah. It was a 10, 10 kilohertz bandwidth. Uh, and so, you know, the name of the company, well, we got to the name of Trimble Navigation, uh, not because I wanted my name on the company, but we had gone through two different ad agencies for names. And when the second one came up with Zodiac, uh, spelled with an X, um, I punted and said, all right, enough is enough. Um, and, um, and so it became Trimble Navigation. Um, and so the first product was a Loran C product that read out in latitude and longitude. Interestingly enough, the Coast Guard couldn't understand why you would want to read out in terms of latitude and longitude uh, when time difference lines were uh, perfectly adequate uh, and perfectly good. Um, and it took us a little while to realize that the main reason you wanted to read out in latitude and longitude is what you were interested in wasn't so much where you were, but what you had to do to get to where you wanted to go. And your destination would be in latitude and longitude. Um, and if, you're, um, uh, if your current position was in latitude longitude, it was real easy to calculate. If they were in uh, time difference lines, uh, not so easy. In any event, uh, we did that. Um, the company started in, uh, in actually November of 78. Um, and by, um, by early 1982, I was looking for the next product. We had, um, uh, we had um, uh, uh, launched our first product. We basically were ready to launch the, um, the follow-on. Um, uh, we were headed towards a $2 million a year, and um, um, I needed another product. Uh, there was the... Uh, uh, there was a satellite system that was currently being used, or was being used at that time by the, by the Navy, called Transit. Uh, and um, this was a system that, uh, that actually um, uh, came about, uh, really inspired by uh, Sputnik. Uh, if you know the satellite's orbit, um, and um, you um, simply record the uh, the Doppler shift as the uh, as the satellite goes overhead, uh, you can get one line of position. So if you put up a number of satellites in polar orbit and form a um, a, um, a squirrel cage around the Earth, uh, you can um, you can end up with um, intersecting lines of position on the Earth, uh, giving you position. And this actually um, allowed the Polaris submarines at sea to uh, uh, to establish their position um, 
with a periscope showing for no more than a couple of hours. Um, and we were looking at that and came close to buying a company, but uh, uh, I knew that Hewlett Packard, uh, Hewlett -Packard had been working on, on GPS, a GPS product um, uh, at the time I left in 78. It was, uh, was something that Ralph Eschenbach had um, designed under the table. In those days, uh, if you were at HP Labs, you could work on anything you wanted 10% of the time. And he, being a pilot, um, um, fell in love with the concept of GPS and started building something. Um, but um, I had gotten word that um, John Young had canceled the GPS project. Um, a few days later, um, a fellow I knew very well, Svanko Fazerink, he was a section manager at, um, at HP Labs, uh, came down to the, um, uh, to the air-conditioned garage that we had in Mountain View and uh, said, uh, Charlie, I know that I advise you not to leave HP uh, with a Loran project because I thought you would fail. You haven't, and as you know, John Young has canceled the GPS project. He's given me the right to sell it. I want you to buy it because you'll do something with it. At that point, um, I mean, it seemed like a fabulous opportunity. There were really only four concerns. Uh, first, um, what was behind John Young's um, uh, canceling the project, because Svanko was absolutely convinced that uh, it was a billion dollar opportunity. Uh, and uh, he related to me the story that um, he, he, he went to John Young with this argument, and John Young had said, well, you know, I have 50% uh, of a $4 billion instrumentation market, and 5% of a $40 billion computer market. I don't need a third market that has nothing to do with the first two. But I think the real reason that it was canceled was that um, there was um, very substantial concern that the U.S. government would not complete the system. In the waning days of the, um, the Carter administration, uh, the system had been downgraded from 24 satellites to 18 for cost-saving measures. So first, first question I needed to answer was, um, uh, will the system be there? Uh, the second problem I was going to face was, uh, uh, how was I going to beat the Japanese to a $100 navigation receiver? Um, Chrysler had shown a, uh, a uh, concept car at a World's Fair with a navigation unit involved, and uh, it had gotten a tremendous amount of press. Um, in those days, the most expensive option for a car was $750 for um, automatic transmission. And the car companies, the minimum margin that they would operate on for a, um, for a factory installed option was three to one. So that said, the car navigation unit had to be $250 and the navigation portion of it was no more than 40% of the whole problem. And this was a GPS system we were thinking about. This right? was, well, what was absolutely obvious, uh, the, the opportunity was um, the billion dollar car navigation market. And we were gonna have to, um, we we're gonna have to race the Japanese to that. Okay, that's the second one. Um, third one was, can I actually come up with the money that John Young is going to require? And the fourth was, uh, Tsvanko let me know that um, it wouldn't make much sense if I hired any of his engineers. So I had to promise not to hire any of his engineers. OK, so these were my, my four questions. I figured um, I, uh, my first step was to go to my mentor, Al Bagley, and ask him, what he thought, uh, because I knew that uh, uh, 
you know, frequency and time division at that point had an atomic clock, a cesium standard that uh, uh, was, was one of the, um, the finest frequency standards in the world. And uh, I knew that he had had conversations uh, with, uh, uh, with, with people in the U.S. government about uh, uh, the GPS market. Uh, and so I asked him, and he said, well, I don't really know, but I've got two people that you can talk to. Um, um, one was um, a fellow by the name of Gerhard Winkler at the Naval Observatory, and the other was a uh, fellow, a colonel by the name of Brad Parkinson at the Joint Program Office. So I called the, I called both of them, um, and uh, they they gave me the words I I wanted to hear, um, um, and they were reasoned arguments of why the system, in all likelihood, was going to be completed. Um, this wouldn't have melted the heart of any CFO, but uh, it was good enough for me, and uh, I figured if this problem were out of the way. Um, the other three problems that I had could be solved in time, and so it was uh, uh, all speed forward and, and, and damn the torpedoes. Uh, so that's how we started. I uh, negotiated with Svanko to, um, to hire, um, uh, to offer consulting uh, to the project team. Um, I, on the basis of pizza and stock. And so this became our um, Wednesday evening uh, uh, meetings. Uh, and when we looked at it, we knew that we were going to have to uh, tie in to um, um, integrated circuits and Moore's Law and use the, uh, the investment in integrated circuits to drive the cost down, um, um, and what we had to do was to come up with a block diagram approach that could be iterate, inter iterated on an 18-month schedule. Uh, we did that. Um, uh, just, uh, the company at that time had four founders? Uh, yeah, there were four of us, um, three technical and a gal by the name of Kit Mura Smith. Um, um, and, uh, uh, we, um, and actually, at that point in time, I had, um, I had a technician, um, John Schmitz, that uh, uh, basically uh, uh, was responsible for production. And uh, no, the, the GPS, we spent a year getting the, the block diagram right. Uh, we recognized that uh, we needed really seven breakthroughs to get there. And um, we, um, we basically um, um, uh, kept poking around the valley until we got breakthroughs. They weren't quite what we wanted, but, but you know, things could be jiggered around so that everything worked. Um, it took us a year to get that, that block diagram approach. Um, and um, then, we started building. Um, uh, by the next September, I actually took two uh, final prototypes back to an ION conference in Boston. I figured I needed to have two because no one would believe that it was reproducible if I only had one. It wasn't a backup. <laughs> no, it wasn't a backup. Um, now, we didn't have money to um, have a booth at the show, but I did have a, um, um, I did have a hotel room. Uh, and actually, the reactions that I got there, um, uh, in retrospect, uh, uh, border on the amusing. Um, I can remember this one fellow handing me my, a card and saying, Give me a call when you sell the second one. Um, but um, out of that show, actually, I got my first customer, um, a division manager in charge of um, uh, the uh, Boston area, Northrop, um, bought uh, one of these things for $100,000. Um, 
And uh, so that actually was my first GPS customer. And um, um, that actually led Northrop to making the first real investment that the company had. Up until that point in time, I had been um, um, uh, I've been using an R&D limited partnership form. This was a um, uh, basically an angel um, financing scheme that um, that allowed um, uh, investors to take 90% um, of their investment um, um, against taxes as we lost money. Um, um, that. Uh, that actually, uh, there was a change in the tax law that uh, prevented that from happening later on, but, but it worked in the beginning. And so for, in the beginning, I was raising a quarter to a third of a million dollars a year uh, to fund things. Uh, we starved. Uh, now, you were still marketing your Loran systems? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and actually, we continued marketing Loran systems up until... Uh, um, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, 21st century. Uh, we added we added GPS to the Loran uh, uh, later on. Uh, in any event, we uh, uh, that first one led to the first real money. Um, Northrop put in three million dollars for 20 percent of the company, um, and. Uh, I figured it was a pretty good deal because um, that represented about five times what our sales was. Um, and in the end game, they came back to me and said, uh, uh, would you mind using a form of, um, of, of debt rather than equity? Uh, so uh, um, basically convertible debt, uh, but the interest um, uh, wouldn't be due until you paid it off, and it had to be paid off when, if you went public or there was change of ownership. Um, otherwise, you could repay it, um, and if you did repay it, um, the warrants went away. So this was the deal, and um, it turns out that, I guess, about four years later, when Northrop ran into trouble and they started consolidating everything back together, um, uh, they came and um, wanted to sell this note. But since we had the right to repay it, no one would give them substantially more than the face value of the note. So uh, we actually found AEG uh, was willing to put in three and a half million dollars to clear note plus interest um, for five percent of the company so I went from from uh, somebody having 20 percent of us to somebody having five percent of us um, and that clearly was one of the uh, the better stock transactions that we made uh, pre-public um, but as I said in the beginning the the whole business plan was driving um, uh, we, we, we thought we were racing the Japanese to the billion dollar car navigation market. And so that meant uh, driving the cost of uh, the GPS receiver to zero. Um, and, um, and, and we were well on our way to doing that. Uh, we get to the end of um, 1985 and um, uh, the uh, joint program office has um, as a whole bunch of satellites ready to be launched into space on the shuttle. Um, our first custom GPS integrated circuit has greatly reduced the size and power of GPS receivers. Uh, we have a licensing deal with a Japanese company for the car navigation market. We have introduced a Loran GPS receiver uh, into the marine navigation market. And we have a GPS sensor that can go into um, the business aviation market. Uh, it looks like the navigation business is about ready to take off. Uh, this is December. In January, the shuttle blows up. And um, with it, the, um, uh, the, um, the GPS satellite ride into space is put on indefinite hold. Uh, the first satellites had gone up with, 
refurbished Atlas boosters. Those had all been used up. To save money, um, the, um, the uh, GPS program had uh, agreed to use the shuttle to get up into uh, low Earth orbit uh, before launching things out to the 10,000 mile radius. Uh, so uh, at that point, it looked like we were um, going to be very lucky if the seven satellites that were in the sky were going to continue to be there until the next satellite went up. And the early markets we had found for GPS, uh, for precision time or, um, or position, um, had, had to do with um, uh, precision time transfer, keeping timekeeping standards uh, in centers like Washington and Paris and Sydney uh, all synchronized, or, uh, or uh, oil exploration. Um, and um, uh, so we had to find another market. Um, our Hail Mary um, approach was to go after the long baseline land survey market. We figured that uh, if we could come up with one very accurate position fix a day, we could disrupt this market. Um, the only way we could, or the best way we could see to approaching this problem was to do differential phase measurements on the reconstructed carrier signals from, from the satellites. Um, and our approach was to make measurements on the satellite signals for the entire th two to three hours that four satellites were in view, and then post-process that with similar data from a base station on an HP mini computer for three hours. We actually made that work almost. Um, we, we took an order from Caltrans for seven systems for, for $500,000. Um, but just after we took the order, we found that occasionally we would get a second answer um, that differed by 12 centimeters for our 10.8 kilometer baseline. Um, this, um, this clearly meant that we had a bug somewhere in the morass of software. Um, we didn't ship. As a consequence, the, uh, the bank pulled our line of credit. Um, and um, in the uh, near-death experience that the company faced, uh, it almost came apart. Um, and actually, I ended up um, um, losing a, uh, a key software engineer that uh, later was to become our only major uh, competition in the, uh, the GPS land survey market. Uh, we found that we got the bug resolved and, um, and, and basically started shipping this improbable system um, to um, uh, mom and pop survey uh, uh, outfits uh, around the world. And it really started to disrupt the land survey market. Uh, later, with increases in computational power and the addition of, uh, of communication, we were able to field survey products that, that provided real-time sub-centimeter accuracy, and later still figured out how to make those things work on moving platforms. Um, this was good, but um, we still didn't have, uh, there still weren't new satellites in the sky, and, uh, and as a parallel effort, uh, we uh, started looking at the only customer that um, was convinced that there were going to be satellites in the sky and therefore might buy things, um, and that was the military. Um, and our first approach was to um, uh, sell to the um, Israeli military. The Israeli military basically uh, takes civilian products and um, and tries to harden them for uh, military applications. So they would buy something that they thought they could use, um, test it until it broke, tell you what broke, and if you would fix it, they would buy another one. 
So in the process of doing this, we figured out how to harden GPS sensors for uh, the drone market. Um, and at that point, um, uh, we decided to go after the Army that, um, that was the number three player uh, among the services for GPS receivers. What had been planned for them was a, basically a 40-pound backpack uh, for the foot soldier. And um, by that point in time, we had gotten the, um, uh, the power down to about three watts, so six D-cell batteries would be fine, um, and a couple of pounds. And we started working with the Army to define what the form factor ought to be. Uh, is it going to be something that is worn on the, um, the arm like a first aid kit? Or is it going to be um, used like a pair of um, uh, 735 binoculars uh, and held up? Well, they decided on the binocular approach and um, came up with a four-line display with two toggle switches and a, and a twist knob. And oh, it had to be really rugged. You, you had to be able to drive a truck over it. Um, so we finished this, they loved it, then they wanted to figure out how to buy enough of these so that they could actually test them. This was a clear problem because um, um, the, um, um, the people in that were currently serving the military definitely did not want an upstart um, selling stuff into the military. Um, uh, that was uh, vastly different. And um, their traditional way of keeping small companies out of this sort of business was to simply buy contracts. So we, we had to come up with a contracting vehicle that couldn't be bought. Uh, the, uh, the solution was um, the Army said, we have $4 million to buy GPS receivers how many receivers will you supply us for $4 million? This was an open competition? This was open competition. Yeah. And um, uh, we won it. Um, and we won it at, uh, uh, we, um, we offered to supply 1,000 GPS receivers for the $4 million. Um, now this was an unheard of price because um, uh, the, uh, the Air Force had uh, gotten um, SRI to do a market study and come up with a projection of what GPS receivers, civilian GPS receivers would cost in high volume by the year 2000. Um, and the number they came up with was in high volume they would be $10,000 a piece. Um, so this is, um, um, this is 89. And um, uh, we found out later that the only reason that the award wasn't protested was that at the last minute, uh, one of the government contractors had convinced a general to put a, uh, uh, a late penalty uh, uh, clause in that they figured would bankrupt us if we took the contract. Well. We delivered the 1,000 units, I believe, about a week early. And, um, um, and actually, I was told later that um, we, um, we provided the, uh, the first, uh, we were the first contractor ever to deliver on time and on budget to the j -Pol. Um The Army started using these things. And um, they found in war games in um, Germany, that the squad with a GPS receiver always beat the squad without the GPS receiver. So by July of 1990, the Army was convinced that this was what they wanted. Um, uh, during this period of time, uh, a fellow by the name of David Towns from Needham convinced first my board and then me that it was time to take the company public. Now, I was running the company at, um, at the, the thinnest margin possible 
um, for profitability so that I could keep normal banking relationships and I was reinvesting between 25 and 30 percent of sales into R&D. And um, my comment to Dave was, I don't think I'm ready because I'm not going to stop investing heavily in R&D. And um, Dave looked at me and said, you know, Wall Street is willing to judge you on any basis you have the guts to sell. Look at Cray Computing. Um, so anyway, um, we went public um, first part of August of that year. And the day we went out, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Um, and um, we, our stock was above water at the end of the day, but it dropped below water um, the following day. Um, so the Gulf War started. And um, soon after it started, um, we got a call from the Pentagon uh, asking us if we could start making more of those receivers that we had delivered to the Army. And oh, by the way, if we wouldn't charge any more than we charged on that contract, they could simply extend the contract. And no, uh, it was going to take a few couple of weeks to get the paperwork started, but would we start the process? Uh, so this started a basis of um, are doing this with ever escalating numbers of, um, of receivers. Uh, the total orders got up to 10,000. Um, now, we had, um, uh, because of the licensing deal I had with the, the Japanese company, I had gotten rights to, um, to put an engineer into their factory, and I had also gotten the rights to um, uh, to buy components um, um, uh, that they used. But in the process of putting um, an engineer in their factory, uh, we actually learned how they were so successful at, um, at cutting the cost of things. You know, while we l thought in terms of um, iterations having um, improvements in block diagrams, they uh, um, uh, they would simply make a material list and take the most expensive item on the material list and figure out how to reduce the price. So um, uh, the deal we had done with the Japanese was explicitly for that generation. And we were, we were turning things on an 18-month schedule. And we were two-thirds of the way to, uh, well, half the way to the next generation. Well, in six months' time, they had reduced the uh, projected factory cost of what we had licensed them below where we thought we could get to um, with our next generation. And what so, were you providing for the Japanese? Uh, uh, we were providing um, a design so that they could go after the car navigation uh, market for, in yeah. Japan for a licensing fee. And they had paid us uh, $5 million for this license. Um, and since th that was our total revenue in, uh, that was equal to our total revenue in 1985, that was a pretty good deal. Uh, especially given the shuttle disaster and there was no, there was no market for a while. But in any event, um, uh, so we had been using for the, um, the product we made for the military, we had been using Japanese cellular, oh, and the way they got the price down was they found suppliers that would fiddle with things until something worked and then freeze the design. They did not work on specifications. They worked on frozen designs. That way you didn't have to understand the second order effects of changes in, um, in how something was made and how it might affect how things worked. Well, in any event, uh, that, that Slugger product uh, uh, was made with uh, cellular telephone parts because they were in high volume, they were cheap, and they were reliable. 
Well, during the fall and winter of 1980, uh, the cellular market uh, went ballistic in Asia. And when Japanese manufacturers hit the, uh, the limits, uh, they start um, holding shipments to, um, to, to American customers, U.S. customers, because we're second tier markets. We're, we're not first tier markets. So um, our production control was not yet automated. Um, we went to positions where we were running 10% shorts on manufacturing. Um, and um, um, we did manage to get 4,500 units out before the, uh, the Hail Mary maneuver through Western Iraq. Um, and the rest of them came out um, in, the, uh, um, in the early spring. Um, but um, as the spring wore on, I kept seeing inventory numbers rise. And it was then that I found that my, my production VP had cracked under the pressure and started triple ordering things. And so uh, we, we had all this inventory coming in. And um, uh, at that point, um, the JPO decided that, well, since what we had produced for Iraq um, worked so well, that they really ought to do it right. And they really shouldn't be using a civilian receiver. They should be using one with a P code. Now, by the way, we built a civilian receiver because we couldn't get clearances for the P code. Um, it wasn't a problem with the technology. Um, so anyway, they redesigned what a handheld was supposed to be and um, then set up a winner-take-all competition between us and Rockwell. Um, I clearly was naive because I, I bit on that. Um, and um, we actually got crushed because even though the uh, requirement was for 50,000 units, um, Rockwell bought the order. Their, now, Rockwell was the prime supplier already. Of, yes, uh, they were. Yeah. They bought the order. Um, their, their winning price was 38% of our projected factory cost. And I had never known Rockwell to be a low-cost supplier. In any event, um, the silver lining in all this, um, well, the lesson is that aerospace companies have trouble competing in commercial markets, and commercial companies have trouble competing in, in um, government markets, largely because the customer is different. Uh, the, uh, we, we learned the hard way that the customer for the government is the purchasing agent, not the end user. Uh, so providing more for the, uh, the end user doesn't buy anything if the cost doesn't go down. Uh, in any event, uh, the silver lining was um, because of what happened in Desert Storm and, uh, and I think in part because we didn't have a dog in the fight, uh, I had access to the top civil and military people in the Pentagon. And, uh, and this access was used um, through the GPS um, uh, Industry Council um, not to try to sell something, but to, um, to give feedback on uh, what the likely consequences of various policy decisions would be. So, we, we played the role of the canary in the mine shaft. And um, actually, we were forced to do that because directly following the Gulf War, uh, the intelligence community decided that they had only about two months to place export license controls on GPS, which they wanted to do. And um, um, uh, we were told that the Pentagon People in the Pentagon couldn't talk to us as an individual. Uh, they could only talk to us as an industry association. So actually, we put together an industry association in 10 days and got, um, got seven CEOs in the most fiercely competitive um, uh, uh, time of the West, uh, 
gunslinging market that you can imagine together to talk to people from the intelligence community and um, uh, come up with a plan for um, um, avoiding export licenses and ITAR controls on, uh, on GPS. Um, we agreed to, um, to put software traps to keep the, uh, the GPS receiver from working above uh, 1,000 knots or, um, or uh, 60,000 feet. Uh, we agreed to provide a Surgeon General warning that the L2 signal uh, uh, belonged to uh, uh, the U.S. military and they could change it at will. Uh, but that worked. And um, uh, that was crucially important. But that was the first of, of the wins. Um, and actually, uh, Tremble drove the, the industry council, but we drove it for the benefit of the entire industry. And uh, we, we operated that one on a shoestring. Uh, member companies, I believe, paid $10,000 a year for incidentals. And then we supplied our own uh, uh, people um, to do whatever needed to get done. Um, but you, you were talking about going beyond then uh, civilian code uh, systems, uh, right? Or, and so you had to have access to the P code, or uh, no? Well, if we were going to if we were going to build receivers for the military, yeah, we had to have the ability to build that portion of the receiver. Yeah, and um, and w uh, later we did get uh, the security clearance for it. It it didn't buy us very much because. Um, uh, frankly, uh, uh, small companies um, get uh, small orders, big companies get big orders uh, when dealing with the government. Uh, but um, it, was, uh, it was something that we tried. Uh, the, um, and along the way, actually, I have two stories that uh, uh, that show that um, it isn't enough. All right, let me back up. How did we figure out? We actually made a transition from focusing on driving the cost of GPS receivers to zero uh, in end user products um, and, um, um, and, and basically monetizing the, um, um, the information aspect of GPS. Um, the, um, um, it was sometime during this um, early market phase uh, when there were only seven satellites in the sky, we started to realize that there was something um, uh, fundamental about the time tagging of events and the um, geotagging of position or, um, uh, or objects, uh, geotagging information, uh, data or objects. And, um, uh, and we started to realize that knowledge of space and time uh, was an information utility. Um, and that caused us to think about the other utilities that, uh, that we're familiar with. And uh, um, it got us to focus on the telephone and looking at the, uh, the multitude of applications that had been generated as the telephone transitioned from analog voice to digital data. Uh, it was then we, we started to realize that GPS could have a, a transformational impact on the way people live and work. Um, that fundamentally, uh, the GPS uh, uh, satellite system provided a global grid to which augmentations could be added uh, to provide solutions that, uh, um, that, that added um, efficiency, accuracy, and assistance. And so markets like um, mining, construction, transportation, um, precision farming, uh, emergency response were, were all open to us. And, um, and that uh, um, we continued to, um, uh, to follow the, um, uh, a high volume thread, uh, but uh, Garmin uh, 
had also benefited uh, from the um, from the Gulf War. Both Magellan and Garmin had benefited from the Gulf War. Uh, we were so tied up in providing units for the military that um, there were no units left over for civilians. And so uh, parents were, were buying civilian units to uh, <laughs> ship with their kids uh, to, um, um, to the Middle East. Um, but we realized it was sometime late in 91 uh, that uh, you know, the cost of the display was now more than the cost of the GPS receiver. And so our leverage in terms of driving things down um, wasn't in a finished product. Um, we continued to make OEM products for um, the car navigation market and actually for other markets uh, where cost indeed was a driver and we drove things to cost below $100 um, uh, per set, uh, but these didn't end up being commercial products. Now these are all single frequency systems? Uh. They're all single frequency systems because uh, the only thing that we had that was dual frequency was um, the survey receivers. Um, and, and actually we had those only because the Japanese in 1987 were being put under excruciating pressure on trade. They weren't buying enough from the United States. And so um, they, the Japanese government decided that what they wanted to do was to buy GPS receivers for their earthquake monitoring systems. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, but they wanted to go beyond that they wanted dual frequency receivers so that we could also remove the ionosphere or the effects of the ionosphere. And um, uh, marvelous story. Um, uh, our agent in Japan calls me up in May and says, you know, they have this requirement uh, uh, and they want three of these systems. Uh, and um, I said, I thought to myself, well, you know, you can make three of anything, uh, and we don't know whether there will still be seven satellites in the sky by the time that uh, uh, we're supposed to deliver these things. So we might as well take the order and gamble that we can find it. We had, at that point in time, we had not seen L2 energy from space. All right, about a month goes by, and he calls me again, Harold calls me again, and says, oh, the number has gone up to 10. And I grumble a little bit. I mean, there's a huge difference between doing three of anything and doing 10 of something. Uh, two weeks later, the number goes up to 25. And I say, Hero, know that we have never seen, I mean, we're now into we're now into July, and um, we have never seen L2 energy. If they ask us for anything, all we can give them is simulator data. And he says, fine, they're not going to need anything more than simulator data. Now, the Japanese government procurement system is supposed to work that they decide during the summer what they want from off-the-shelf things. They sign the contract in September, um, and um, Delivery is the 1st of April, and if you fail to meet the delivery the 1st of April, you are forever banned from doing, blacklisted, from doing Let's business. Let's clarify a point. The, you said you'd never seen the energy. I mean, it was there. You just hadn't built the unit to No, we, we actually, with spectrum analyzers or anything, had never observed it. It is so far in the noise. But, I mean, the signal was there. You just oh, the signal was there, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. The satellite emits it, and we know that, and we know... We know all of the physics of the satellite signal structure. We just hadn't seen it. Uh, I mean, it is devilishly difficult to find. And as a matter of fact, once we started looking, it took us six weeks. And that's because there's no CA signal to help you well, out? Well, there, uh, there is no CA signal. Uh, you do, you actually have to use the CA signal and know the relationships between uh, um, the L1 and the L2 to actually be able to find things. Um, but uh, 
but we hadn't we hadn't done that um, and um, so there was a sequence of things uh, midway through August uh, that uh, uh, where the Japanese wanted data, we sent them data and said, this is only simulator data. 48 hours later, Hero calls and says, they say it's simulator data. And we say, so? Um, they need data. And we say, we don't have it. Finally, he calls up and says, uh, if you can't supply data in the next 24 hours, um, the deal is off. Well, that night, Timo sees his first L2 data. And we send them a record, and uh, we, we now have this contract to, uh, to build 25 of these systems. I mean, we've seen data, but we have nothing else, okay, um, for a uh, codeless L2 receiver. Um, we have basically eight months to build these 25 things, and uh, I, I bring Jim Sorden in from, from HP as, uh, uh, he's, he's an engineer, and he was a uh, uh, project manager, uh, but he's, he's truly an army sergeant, and uh, he, can, he actually is a finisher. And he managed to get the 86 boxes delivered to the Japanese before the 1st of April. And they worked. Now later, I found out how Sony had made the delivery on their L2 receiver, which never worked. But they got paid, and they weren't blacklisted. They delivered the receiver, and oh, the software was coming later. All right. So it had two channels, but no software. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Uh, now, uh, back to the... Uh, the set of stories, um, um, we first, uh, we realized, we, we first realized that we were going to have to um, get involved in protecting um, the availability of the GPS signals. Um, um, when we got word that there was a, um, uh, a troublesome writer that had been added to the Senate version of the Armed Forces Appropriations Bill. Uh, this writer called for the military to limit the accuracy of, uh, of differential GPS in the Gulf of Mexico to 10 meters. I mean, we were routinely doing it to a foot at that point in time. Um, so we weren't, I mean, since differential GPS fundamentally takes out um, any of the errors in the satellite. There was no way that they could, um, they could do something with the satellite. So we weren't sure how they were going to do it, but this wasn't going to keep people from trying and um, making a mess of things. Um, fortunately, on my first visit to Washington, I met uh, Scott Pace, then a, an assistant secretary of commerce. Um, Scott was to become our, um, our guide and uh, trusted ally in the Washington maze. And when he heard the story, he explained to us what was going on and introduced us to Jay Kimmett, um, the senior staffer on the, uh, the Senate Armed Services uh, Appropriations Committee. Jay was really surprised that there was a, uh, there was a problem with the writer. In his words, this writer was supposed to be apple pie, motherhood, and the American flag. When he understood the issue, he uh, volunteered to try to get it removed in conference committee, but warned us that this couldn't be a guarantee because uh, this, there was frenetic activity in merging the two bills. The only way that we were going to be sure that this didn't make it into law was to uh, get the senior senator from Louisiana to withdraw it. And probably the only way we were going to be able to do that was to get the writer's beneficiary to request that it be withdrawn. And uh, to make life a little more interesting, we had between 10 days and two weeks to get this done. 
I mean, they were in conference committee and it was going to come out. Fortunately, the following week there was an, a, there was an oil uh, uh, industry conference being held in New Orleans and a Shell Exploration VP uh, called for a straw vote on the writer. The writer was 13 to 0 with one abstention. At that point, the Shell VP is reported to have turned to the, uh, to the abstaining um, oil service company CEO and saying, I think the industry has spoken. If you want another contract from any of us, you'll get that writer removed. And then for insurance, the senator was called and told that if he wanted any further campaign contributions from big oil, uh, the writer would be, would be withdrawn. It was. Um, now, this wasn't the, um, the last of the, um, uh, the political battles. Um, um, uh, another one on the international front um, has to do with the World Radio Conference. The World Radio Conference is, a, is an arm of the United Nations. And um, um, this conference uh, allocates radio spectrum on, a, on, the in, on an international basis. Um, now, historically, this had been a technocratic gentleman's club uh, made up of representatives from the telecommunication agencies of countries around the world. But all that changed um, in 1994 when um, the United States proposed granting a block of spectrum to um, uh, Teledesic for an 840 satellite uh, constellation, uh, sa communication uh, constellation. They not only proposed it, but had locked up the votes to pass it. Um, as the story goes, well, first, the Europeans cried foul but they lost. Um, as the story goes, Bill Gates had uh, hired two past uh, work presidents to go around the world offering telecommunication agencies payment of back dues for their vote on this proposal. Okay, so he the- was, He was for it? Oh yeah, for yeah. the proposal. Yeah, okay. Um, well, most telecommunication, I mean, as the Europeans, that had, um, 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 come on, Intersat, come on. Com I want to say Comsat, but uh, Intelsat. Um, uh, Inmarsat, Inmarsat. They had Inmarsat. Um, and um, so anyway, um, for the 1997 work, the British and, fr and French proposed uh, taking the um, the bottom five megahertz of the GPS spectrum and putting it as the top five megahertz of uh, Inmarsat's telecommunications band, satellite telecommunications band. Um, and by the time we found out about the proposal, they had locked up 47 of the 93 countries eligible to vote on it. Payback time. Um, while this was problematic for us, it was a real problem for NASA. They had no standing to argue the issue because um, they had no protection to use GPS in space, and they were highly vulnerable. Coupling NASA to our cause, we interested some of the top people in the Clinton White House and got a ex-governor appointed as war ambassador. When we arrived in Geneva, the state of play was 47 to 6. On our side stood Russia, Syria, Senegal, and Tonga. Internationally, the airline industry was aghast at the proposal from a standpoint of airline safety, and uh, United and Americans sent pilot executives to help. Our strategy was to get the issue remanded to study and um, taken up and voted on at the following uh, war. But 
technical arguments and reason were having no effect on cracking the voting block. Our first break came from the American pilot. His father was head of the Lockerbie 103 group in Scotland, and he knew how to get a fax into 10 Downing Street. Uh, the fax was supposed to say something to the effect that, is Great Britain going to place narrow commercial interest above airline passenger safety? He gave us a phone number and told us when the operator answers, just say, incoming fax, hun, and hang up. The following morning, the British ambassador came by and commented, a little below the belt, old chap, but nothing more. At this point, we were three days away from a vote. Fortunately, we were able to get to Wesley Clark, then Supreme European Allied Command, NATO commander, and he placed a call to the British Prime Minister. He's reported to have said, we're carrying your water in Kosovo. Stop screwing with our GPS. Following day, the British ambassador proposed remanding the issue to study and having it taken up at the following work. Another bullet dodged. Um, in the time between works, we joined with, um, with NASA and the U.S. Department of Commerce in um, an outreach effort to the telecommunication agencies around the world. These people knew a lot about telecommunications, but nothing about GPS. None of the constituents that they served had anything to do with GPS. Um, and so we showed how GPS was used in their countries. We demonstrated equipment, and uh, we, uh, we had test data showing how realized GPS performance would be adversely affected with, uh, with this proposal. The vote at the subsequent work was unanimous, 102 to 0. The uh, lesson here is that uh, innovation had driven realized GPS receiver performance. And this realized performance protected both the spectrum and the pristine noise floor. Uh, if minimum design specifications had been used, innovation could have been applied to compromise satellite system capability. Um, we fought frequency wars with time domain. Um, they um, had convinced, you know, 1996 Telecommunication Act had stripped uh, technical expertise from the F um, um, FTA, FCC, had stripped the technical expertise from the FCC. They were supposed to, Congress wanted them to rely on um, 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 their uh, constituents uh, to uh, supply it. Um, and um, Time Domain had convinced the um, FCC that uh, they were using only half of the available spectrum. They were allocating frequency in the spectrum, but they weren't allocating Time Domain. Uh, Guess none of these people had, uh, uh, ha had uh, in college heard of Fourier and uh, the mathematical connection between time and frequency. But in any event, uh, we had um, um, a major political battle. Um, all they wanted to do was to allow the, um, uh, uh, the time domain signals to, uh, uh, to put, to raise the noise floor up to the unintended um, uh, limit that the FCC had found. Well, you know, when, when you have a operating system and you have some unintended emissions, you're not using the entire noise floor, the, the entire spectrum of the floor. You may have a line or two. But uh, this was going to use up the entire um, spectrum, um, and they wanted the total spectrum from DC to daylight. 
we were fighting back that um, um, if you're going to do this, you want to do this at higher frequencies. And as a matter of fact, uh, to protect the, uh, uh, the cellular system, uh, you had to be well above the 2 gigahertz region. Um, and, and actually, we were proposing that um, uh, if they wanted to play in the sandbox, they could play above 3.2 gigahertz. Uh, there was an FCC vote. Um, and uh, fortunately, the FCC has a rule that after something is voted on, clerical errors can be addressed. Um, fortunately, a, a, um, an assistant secretary of defense um, who, uh, who belongs to the, the National Academies um, paid a visit to, uh, uh, to the FCC chairman and uh, uh, found that uh, the clerical error was not including the words um, um, above 3.2 gigahertz. This was, in my mind, real payback from losing out to Rockwell for the military market. Um, later still, there was um, uh, uh, Light Squared, which was another um, um, political free-for-all. Um, and again, it was realized GPS performance that was the, uh, uh, the issue that pushed back against them. They're not dead. I mean, there's a reincarnation now that is still after the frequency. But now that uh, the GPS has, has actually migrated, and, uh, and, and more or less, with the exception of the dual frequency or multiple frequency GPS receivers or multiple satellite system uh, receivers, um, GPS has, um, has actually disappeared. You, you won't find it inside of your cell phone. Um, uh, GPS is, uh, is actually a cell that is in one of the digital chips um, in the cell phone. And uh, Garmin has having a really tough time now uh, selling car navigation sets because uh, they can't tell you that uh, 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 there's traffic ahead and you should take an alternate route and, and route you on the alternate route, um, which of course you can do once you have a cell phone. Um, and, uh, and actually, I found, uh, talking to people at Trimble, uh, they now have um, uh, programmed a, uh, uh, a, a smartphone to solve the GPS problem totally in software inside the cell phone. Um, and uh, well, when you think about it, um, compute power has increased by more than six orders of magnitude since we started in this game. And, uh, we knew that we knew that two things that the only way to make gps ubiquitous was to drive the price to zero and once we drove the price to zero it would be uh, um, it, it would become ubiquitous and um, and actually our um, our easy alliance with the military came about because we convinced them that since they had the levers to turn back on selective availability in the satellites, they could, in, in theaters of operation, um, really degrade civilian GPS. And if we could make GPS free, then it would become the world standard. Because it is really tough to compete with a utility and almost impossible to compete with a free utility. And so, um, so, uh, so you know, it was, it was about the time, it was just before the time, well, just after the Gulf War, that, um, that as the company, we focused our attention on, um, on exploiting GPS information or, or the information involved in position and time and specialized software for uh, 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 market-specific applications, that was how we monetized GPS. Uh, you, you were talking about uh, earlier um, 
uh, of actually digitizing the signals up front and then doing all the rest in software? Uh, did you go that far? Yes. You know, so like you, you're working maybe at a couple of megahertz uh, sampled signals and feeding them right into a yeah. processor. Yeah. yeah, as a matter of fact, our, our first GPS, um, we, we did a single stage down conversion to four megahertz. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of the, uh, one of the seven things that uh, breakthroughs we needed was how in those days to make a single stage down converter uh, 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 for GPS. Uh, a, a doubling image reject mixer was the solution, but uh, and that's good enough. <laughs> it was good enough. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so you survived the wars to... Uh, <laughs> we survived the wars. Um, I, that was I, for frequency allocation and communications, not... Oh, yeah. I, well, affair. hey, let's face it. Um, um, communicate. If you have to make a choice, you're going to take communication before you take information on position and time. You really want both. Uh, there is an incredible need for spectrum space, and um, uh, the only way the only way we're going to continue to be able to get increased spectrum for what we need is by going up. Um, but there, nobody wants to go up because it's more expensive to go up, and besides that, you get into more and more environmental uh, situations as you go Rain up. Rain cloud. But you know, at, at 77 gigahertz, you can um, beam steer from antennas that are on an IC chip. But that's fine for local. <laughs> fine. Yeah. Um, it turns out, it turns out that um, most communication, um, unless you are in the air or unless um, you are at sea, uh, most places in the developed world, you have fiber. And frequencies can be infinitely reused by just adding fiber. Yeah, I mean, the internet is, is through cables, not... Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so, so basically, um, uh, the place that satellite communication and... Uh, well, hey, I still get my internet from satellite uh, in the San Juan Islands out of Seattle. Uh, it's right on the Canadian border. I cannot, no I don't, cable. <laughs> uh, there's no cable and uh, I can't get a microwave link to, uh, uh, to somebody that is uh, broadcasting. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you can't cover the world that way. <laughs> you can't, well, uh, actually we knew when China started bearing fiber optic cable along the rail lines that they were not going to go down the path of uh, using uh, satellites for their basic communication. Um, India doesn't have that yet and uh, still needs it. Um, broadcast television um, in Asia is, uh, from satellites is clearly important. So, okay, we've, uh, like I say, we've covered a, a lot of territory here, uh, coming right up to, uh, I guess, almost uh, current time at, at uh, let's see, you, you left um, uh, Trimble uh, a decade or so ago. Two. Two decades ago. Two decades ago. So. Uh, um, I've, uh, what I'm doing now, and I'm, um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm providing uh, seed capital for uh, 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 high-risk research at Caltech, and uh, the uh, the most recent victory is the uh, uh, the uh, climate modeling initiative uh, that uh, basically is going to do a reboot on climate modeling, um, uh, uh, fundamentally being data-driven and. Uh, from uh, space-based uh, space-based data and um, um, uh, and and solving some of the really tough problems uh, computationally, uh, you know, gapping computationally. Uh, 
And uh, so they've just put together the uh, uh, consortium of private philanthropy that will be providing um, uh, five million dollars a year for five years um, for this effort. And it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's a consortium that um, involves Caltech, JPL, MIT, uh, uh, Naval Postgraduate School, and, uh, uh, and there will be others. But uh, um, so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what my, uh, the high risk research at Caltech is, uh, is my passion right now. Okay. And let's see, there were a few little notes I'd made in here uh, uh, that uh, <laughs> events in this long history. A meeting with uh, Bill Buckley. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, these are back in the, um, uh, he, he, first, um, he first discovered us with Loran because we were producing uh, Loran C receivers that read out in terms of latitude and longitude. And if you had a sailboat, you could find an ocean buoy based on the latitude longitude of, uh, of the light list. Um, where you couldn't find them using the Coast Guard um, uh, time difference things. So he first uh, came across us in the Loran days and uh, 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 described us uh, 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 basically, uh, what did he say, uh, uh, a Disney um, uh, shop of elves uh, uh, doing magic. But in any event, at one point, um, he decided that he wanted to do his, um, his trip across the Pacific. And we had just produced the first GPS receivers. We had sold one to uh, Northrop, and, uh, and we were starting to sell them into the oil service industry. Uh, and he wanted to borrow a GPS receiver to uh, sail with him across the Pacific. And, uh, uh, now, we were a little bit leery because um, in those days, um, you had to know your position to a degree uh, to be able to make GPS work. Uh, now, you know, for most applications we were up to, uh, this was going to be fine because navigation wasn't going to be one of them. You mean to initiate the process? Of yeah, to initiate yeah. it, to, yeah. to find the signals. Yeah. You needed to know it to a degree. And he brought his technical person um, um, with him and uh, um, so we went through the training but we were sort of leery um, when he was a day and a half out of Hawaii he calls us and says it doesn't work and so we start going through the um, the operation again of entering approximate position and once they get the entry of approximate position he has approximate position because uh, he loves his sextant fixes um, uh, the, um, he, he took it across the Pacific and um, uh, he um, uh, so on his way back he calls me at midnight and he, he, um, he says um, I'm at um, um, Trader Vic's in San Francisco uh, uh, I have the GPS receiver do you want it now or in the morning and I tell him I, I'll take it now and he says you know uh, this was really pretty accurate it was once within a mile of my sextant fixes <laughs> okay yeah that's a great note uh, so let's see, is there anything that we've uh, overlooked? Uh, I think you've given us an a insightful, beautiful uh, story of Trimble and how that all came to be. Well, I can say that it was a lot of fun and uh, there are very few technologies that you can ride for a couple of decades. Um, GPS turned out to be one of them. Um, and. Uh, uh, I know that um, as a young engineer in 19, at, for the Christmas party in 1964, I found myself at the Christmas party 
sitting next to David Packard at, uh, at the, uh, uh, the Palo Alto uh, Country Club and uh, uh, got him to talking about early days in, uh, at HP. And at one point he said, you know, when the company is small, luck plays a real part. And I can distinctly remember saying, you know, um, he's really humble. Now I know he was telling the goddamn truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the uh, early days of Hewlett Packard were quite a story in its own right. So. Oh, absolutely. And uh, uh, actually, I had this concept um, of, uh, you know, a ball either uh, is a good bounce and it bounces toward you or it's a bad bounce and it bounces away from you. And I kept track of how many bad bounces I could have and still survive. And I was down to zero tolerance of bad bounces on several occasions. Uh, if one wants to be entrepreneurial, uh, one has to deal with a great deal of ambiguity. And I can remember being very happy when I got to the point that I didn't have to bet the company more often than once a year. Uh, it's, um, you know, there, but for the grace of God go I. I mean, that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's truly what it is. Yeah, well, that's great. Okay, I think we can uh, end it there. It's, uh, thank you very much for taking your time to let us record this story in this place. <laughs> well, hey, thank you this, for uh, uh, getting me to uh, reminisce uh, about things that uh, I really hadn't thought about for uh, well over a decade. Yeah, I always, always think of this place where we're sitting was the company of Silicon Graphics, which Absolutely. is no more. And up the street, Facebook is where Sun Microsystems used to be, but Tremble is still hanging on, so the best. 